The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the first section is education and skills. Uh, questions one and eight have been grouped together, so I call question number one, David Stewart. To ask this question, what assessment is made of how research capabilities in higher education have been affected by Brexit? Richard Lockhead. Given the strong international connections of Scotland's world-leading research base, the UK government's chaotic handling of Brexit does indeed threaten to disproportionately affect Scotland's university research and further education. Mm. The total share of UK and Scottish Horizon 2020 projects is already falling according to the latest figures. If there is no deal, this could result in a loss of income for Scottish research organisations of an estimated total £37 million, depending on the Brexit date. And around a quarter of full-time research staff at Scottish universities are non-UK EU citizens. And there's already anecdotal evidence that fewer EU citizens are applying for research jobs in Scotland. And some of those based here are relocating back to their home countries uh, as well. So we will continue to closely monitor the relevant data sources on an ongoing basis. David Stewart. Mm. Uh, the Minister will be well aware of the crucial role that the EU plays in research and development within higher education, such as items he's already mentioned, Horizon 2020, Interreg and the EU structural funds. Does the Minister share my view that EU funding has been key in the development of UHI in my region, for example, with uh, great examples of the Centre for Health Science and ILEX Innovation and Life Sciences? What discussion has the Scottish Government had with the UK Government about accessing the UK Shared Prosperity Fund to fill the huge and substantial research funding vacuum post-Brexit? Richard Lockhead. Uh, Dave Stewart quite rightly highlights one of the institutions most affected by Brexit of any shape or form. And indeed, it's fair to say that the University of Helens and Islands wouldn't exist potentially if it hadn't been for EU funding uh, in the first place. And I saw just this week another EU grant uh, being awarded to UHI that was in the news just a couple of days ago. I can assure Dave Stewart that we recognise the impact, the devastating impact on UHI uh, of Brexit should that go ahead. And that's a regular issue I do raise with my UK counterparts. And also, as Dave Stewart suggests, the need to ensure that any funding lost from leaving the EU is replicated by the, the UK government. We've yet to have those assurances. We've not had any guarantees along those lines. And it's important that we do have our share of UK research funds if indeed we do leave the EU. But of course, the solution is not to leave the EU in the first place. Question number eight, Jenny Gilruth. Citing officer, to ask the Scottish government what impact Brexit will have on higher education institutions. Richard Lockhead. Well, a lessening of access to European research programmes could see Scottish institutions lose in some cases, as I've just discussed, and in some cases up to a quarter of their total research funding. A reduction in the number of EU citizens coming to work and study at our universities, meanwhile, threatens our research excellence and the ability of our institutions to continue providing certain courses and would lead to a loss of the multi multiculturalism that is so absolutely vital to our campus' success and experience of our students in Scotland. So the Scottish Government continues to work tirelessly with the sector to protect our institutions from the damage of an unwanted Brexit and what that would entail. And we continue to make strongly the case to the UK Government, the views of Scotland and those of our universities and further and higher education institutions. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for that response. A fifth of St Andrews University funding comes directly from EU sources. Has the Scottish Government undertaken any analysis of how a reduction in EU funding will impact higher education institutions, their ability to provide a quality education and how this might affect local economies? Richard Lockhead. Well, St Andrews is, of course, one of Scotland's uh, leading higher es education institutions, uh, and one of the reasons why it's doing well, of course, is due to its European collaboration and its research funding it uh, gets through the European research programmes, as, as highlighted by Jenny Goldruth. Uh, so, as I've said in my previous answer, we have looked closely at the potential impact of Scotland. We punch above our weight when it comes to securing Horizon 2020 research funding, way above the rest of the UK and therefore we are going to be disproportionately damaged if we lose access to those programmes. So at the very least, in any of the Brexit scenarios, should they happen, we have to have full participation in the future Horizon 2020 funding programmes. Um, as yet, as again I've said before, uh, unfortunately for St Andrews University and the rest of our institutions, we have not had any such guarantees in the UK Government as yet. Uh, can I ask for shorter questions and answers for the supplementaries, please? Gillian Martin, followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, President Officer. 
Brexit will also affect students from EU countries wishing to study our universities. The UK government has talked about three-year study, three study visas, but given that Scottish undergraduate courses last four years, what is the Scottish government doing to highlight to the UK government that a three-year visa system will simply not work in Scotland? Richard Lockhead. <coughs> well, today, it so happens, I met the chairs of the university courts for a meeting, and I, I think it's fair to say their number one concern they were expressing to me, amongst many concerns uh, from Brexit, was the uh, impact on the, of the UK's immigration policy and the ludicrous, infuriating fact that the current immigration policy for students has been designed around the English degree and not the Scottish degree of four years, as highlighted by Gillian Martin. And this just gives any evidence, if anyone still needs it, that Scotland is an afterthought when it comes to UK policy making and its impact on Scottish further and higher education. It is disgraceful and it's caused a lot of anger amongst our institutions and of course our student population as well. And we're making the strongest possible representations to make sure that should we leave the EU, that the subsequent immigration uh, policy takes into account the distinctive nature of Scottish higher education. Willie Rennie. Uh, I think the Minister will agree with me that the best way to make all of this stop is to stop Brexit altogether. But the most important thing is also that we maintain relationships between the European universities and the Scottish universities. Has he had any discussions with higher education ministers in European countries about keeping those close relationships together so that when we do stop Brexit, those relationships can continue? Richard Lockhead. Uh, that's an important issue that Willie Rennie raises, and we have discussed maintaining our relationship with European institutions, with Scottish higher education institutions, and we've lent our support to their uh, relationships with the European institutions. And we do have some plans to reach out directly from the Scottish Government to them. I know the UK Government claim to have done that as well, because we raised that with them at our meeting with the UK ministers, and they say they're in contact with the, UK, uh, the European institutions. So it's certainly an issue that's high up our agenda, we're certainly going to pursue, because we absolutely have to protect those very valuable relationships. Question number two, Annabel Ewing. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with the operation of the Developing the Young Workforce programme in Fife. Jamie Hepburn. We have seen good progress in developing the young workforce uh, in Fife. Collaboration between Fife College and local schools is ensuring career education is central to the curriculum offer, supporting young people to identify their own skills and learn in a range of settings within their senior phase. In addition, the DYW Regional Group has connected schools and employers a significant partnership and Andrews Links Trust is providing a wide range of programmes, including new opportunities through their pre-employment academy for young people at risk of a negative destination. Annabel Ewing. I, I thank the Minister for his answer, and I am pleased to note that good progress is being made in Fife. Given that a key issue for the programme's architects, or Ian Wood, was to see primary school children involved, can the Minister provide an update as to whether all primary schools in Cowton Beath constituency are now participating so that pupils can be inspired from a young age about the wide opportunities of the world of work. Jamie Hepburn. Uh, the short answer, uh, President Officer, is yes. There's a very strong focus in DYW in the County Beath uh, Primary uh, Cluster. For example, Kelty Primary has created a teaching resource folder to assist with embedding DYW into the curriculum. Uh, Bernerthy Primary uh, meets with local employers to, to co-design programmes and engagement between industry and education. Crossgates Primary School runs a, a Skills and Enterprise Academy programme. And uh, six primary schools in Ms Ewing's uh, constituency are going to take part on the 7th of uh, June in the Green Power Trust Goblin Kit Car Race event, which uh, is, involves them working with uh, local engineering firms and uh, small and medium enterprises to, to design uh, 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 and build from scratch a, a, a car and uh, race. That will take place on the 7th of June at Race 1 County Beath. I'm sure Ms Ewing will be delighted to be there if she's available. Question number three, Miles Briggs. To ask the Scottish Government, what proportion of graduates from Scottish medical schools go on to work in the NHS in Scotland? Richard Lockhead. From the Higher Education Statistics Agency's designation of leavers from Higher Education Survey, in 2016-17, of those working six months after graduation, around 66%, two-thirds of clinical medicine UK and EU domicile graduates were from Scottish higher education institutions and working for an NHS organisation in Scotland. Miles Briggs. I thank the Minister for that answer. In July um, of 2018, before uh, the member became the Minister, he said in the Press and Journal, we need radical interventions to effectively handcuff more doctors trained in Scotland at public expense to the Scottish NHS, at least for a set period of time. Now, although I don't agree with the language used, what progr progress is SNP ministers making to actually develop a bonding scheme 
Richard Lockett. Uh, I congratulate the member's researcher for digging out these fantastic quotes and the local member for Murray constituency. Uh, I should say that the Scottish Government, of course, are continuing to look at other initiatives to uh, address this issue, but have taken a number of bold steps over the last couple of years alone, which I'm sure the member is aware of. And indeed, the medical undergraduate intake since 2007 has increased uh, significantly, but indeed, just from 1819, there was 953 places up to 1,038 scheduled for 2021. And indeed, there's also been an increase of Scottish domicile intake from 485 in 2015-16 to 515 for 2017-18. And as the member will know, we do take advice from a, a committee of medical professionals on the workforce demands, and that's where we take our guidance from a number of uh, graduates and the graduates required in Scotland. So we are continuing to look for even more bolder steps, but we've taken a number of bolder steps that are set to make a material difference. Question number four, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on expert advice presented to the Education and Skills Committee regarding a reduction of subject choice in schools. John Swinney. Mr. Officer, curriculum for excellence provides significant flexibility, and schools now have the freedom to design a three year senior phase, including a range of courses and qualifications tailored to meet the needs of young people at school. Wherever possible, subjects should ensure that young people can choose their preferred subjects in the senior phase, working with partners to do so. What matters is the qualifications and awards that pupils leave school with, and not only what they study in S4. Last year, a record proportion went on to positive destinations, including work, training or further study. Finlay Carson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the copious amount of evidence presented to the Education Committee on the teaching of several levels of course in the same classroom. Evidence suggests that it's substan it has substantial repercussions for subject choice and teachers' ability to prepare students, particularly in science subjects. Can the Cabinet Secretary say how many schools are being forced to teach multi-level courses in science subjects within Dumfries and Galloway and Galloway and West Dumfries? John Swinney. I, I, I don't have that information to hand, but I, I, th I think Mr Carson should know that multi-level teaching has been a feature of Scottish education for uh, a long, long time. Indeed, multi-level teaching was around when even I was at school, which is not yesterday, uh, presiding officer. So this is not a new phenomenon. And I would just simply say to, um, to, to Mr. Carson, every effort is made to meet the needs of young people in their choices of subjects. And I think it's important as we look through this debate that we take a whole range of different uh, evidence. Um, Mr Carson cited evidence that the Education Committee had, uh, has seen on the subject. He may also have seen the comments of another expert, Professor Mark Priestley of the University of Stirling, who yesterday said, this is not new news, the subject to which Mr Carson refers. It is at least the third time we've seen a moral panic about curriculum narrowing, each one based on low level, superficial, and sometimes flawed analysis of largely publicly available data, there is a need for a more nuanced approach. And that's what I'm interested in, which we'll take forward in the debate that's about to happen this afternoon, to make sure we meet the needs of young people in Scotland. Emma Harper for supplementary. The number of subjects pupils sit is a matter solely for the individual schools and head teachers to determine and should not be a matter for local authorities. Does the Cabinet Secretary therefore agree that members should ensure they have their information correct before misleading statements to local press, therefore misleading the public, parents and teachers? And does he agree that all evidence should be considered to reach an evidence-based conclusion? John well, I, I, I do think there should be accuracy in statements that are made and in the detail that's provided. I, I'm not sure the points to which um, uh, Emma Harper refers, but I'm sure they're um, well validated. Um, I do think it's important we have an evidence debate on this subject because the future of young people depends on the way in which we look at that evidence. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to young people from armed forces families when applying for further and higher education. Richard Lockhead. We are committed to supporting all students, including those from armed forces families. Members of the armed forces and the families who are ordinarily resident in Scotland can, assuming they meet the normal eligibility rules, apply to the Students Awards Agency Scotland to fund their higher education tuition fees. 
This is in addition to potential living cost support of both bursaries and loans that may be available, again in line with well understood criteria. In relation to further education, members of the armed forces and their families who are ordinarily resident in Scotland can apply at their college to fund the cost of their tuition. But the member has rightly raised a number of issues in relation to constituency cases and correspondence with myself, uh, and we are actively looking into these concerns. So I, I clearly hope to be able to update her more fully in due course. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Minister knows, my constituent Abigail has been living with her grandfather in Scotland since June 2018. Her parents sold their home in England as her father is being transferred to Faz Lane, and Scotland, of course, will be their new home. But he's at sea for six months, so they haven't yet bought a house locally. Abigail wants to study engineering, but she has been denied funding to go to college because she doesn't meet exactly the residency criteria. It seems desperately unfair and goes against the spirit, I believe, of the Armed Forces Covenant. I am grateful to the Minister for his letter of an hour ago. Could he outline what further consideration is being given to this? Um, because there's clearly some urgency if Abigail is to go to college this year. Richard Lockett. I have asked my officials to look into this case in more detail. I was keen to reply to the member before today's question to put her in a picture as to what we were thinking. Um, clearly, there are different arrangements for further education, higher education, and the issue with further education is the fact there's no reciprocal arrangements with other UK administrations. Therefore, clearly, she will understand we can't find ourselves in a position where we're doing one thing, the SVQ is doing something different that doesn't support Scottish students. So I ask her to rest assured, I am looking at this. I think there is something to be looked at here. But clearly, we do have a law and we do regulations, so we have to look at them carefully. I have a quick supplementary, please, from Maurice Corey. Uh, could the Minister advise what measures are in place specifically to help veterans who may need some form of additional learning support? And does the Scottish Government feel that more could be done to help veterans succeed once they have a place in further or higher education? Richard Lockhead. Well, the Minister for Veterans, uh, Graham Day, is taking an interest in these issues, I can assure the member, and I'm happy to update him on our conversations that are planned on what extra support could be made available for students from um, armed services who have um, extra needs uh, when they're for their higher education. There are some uh, measures in place, I understand, and I'd be happy to write to the member about that. Question number six, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the announcement that SQA staff are to be balloted for industrial action. John Swinney. Presenting officer, this is of course an operational matter for the Scottish Qualifications Authority, but I can assure Daniel Johnson and Parliament that the Scottish Government is in regular contact with the SQA to monitor the safe delivery of the 2019 exam diet and to ensure that appropriate contingency arrangements are in place. Um, I would take this opportunity to urge the Scottish Qualification Authority and the unions concerned to continue their discussions to reach a resolution. Daniel Johnson. The SQA are due to meet with uh, the Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service again next week. So can I ask what specific action the Education Secretary will take to ensure that the concerns of staff are taken seriously by the SQA, especially given how long it took them to engage with trade unions in the first place, but also to ensure that workforce's confidence in the leadership of that organisation is restored? John Swinney. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, some of the trade unions have... Um, been in agreement with the restructuring proposals that have been taken forward by the Scottish Qualifications Authority. So it's not all of the trade unions that are involved in the particular action that Mr Johnson cites. Um, I think in general it is good and constructive practice for there to be effective and engaged dialogue about resolving any of these questions with the workforce. The government's application of the fair work principles would be consistent with that whole approach and we would expect the SQA to operate under that basis. And I do hope that the discussions that take place uh, under the auspices of ACAS will be um, constructive discussions to lead to a resolution. On the question of leadership of the SQA, uh, Daniel Johnson may have noted this morning that the announcement was made of the appointment of the successor to Janet Brown as Chief Executive of the Scottish Qualifications Authority. And I'm delighted to congratulate Fiona Robertson on her appointment to that significant role in Scottish education. Question number seven, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is seeking to improve educational support for young adults when transitioning from children's to adult services. John Swinney. President Officer, the most recent statistics indicate that 94.4% of all school leavers had a positive destination, including work, training or further study, in three months of leaving school. 
We recognise the importance of preparing our young people for life beyond school and the range of supports in schools across Scotland to help pupils with this. In addition, education authorities have specific duties to prepare pupils with additional support needs for their post-school transition, which should happen no later than two years before they leave school. Bob Doris. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, my constituent Jennifer is turning 18, has both physical and cognitive impairments and has been supported in specialist education throughout her time at school. Uh, Jennifer, considering an NQ and work and living skills at college, has only recently been notified of her adult social worker and they will meet for the first time shortly. It is very unclear how the Council will support Jennifer, including the use of self-directed support, which can be restrictive within Glasgow City Council, yet she's a major decision to make on her educational future. How can we ensure local authorities better support families to plan for such transitions such as Jennifer's? Because Jennifer and her mother Crystal feel Glasgow City Council have assisted far more and at a far earlier stage. John Swinney. Well, I'm concerned about the details that um, Mr Doris has raised with me. Um, I would reiterate the point I made in my earlier answer that at least two years before a young person is uh, considered to be leaving school, there should be engagement to begin to handle the transition arrangements, which I recognise to be significant, particularly for young people with additional support needs uh, and who may also have disabilities. So we are working with a range of uh, organisations, with integration authorities and social care providers uh, to ensure that our approach addresses the very circumstances that Mr Doris raises. Um, I'm very happy to look at the specific case um, to see if there's any further intervention the government can encourage uh, to ensure that Jennifer's needs are, uh, are best addressed and that she can make that effective transition uh, to a post-school environment. That concludes the questions on education and skills and we will move on to the portfolio of health and sport. Can I ask that some thought is given please to fairly short questions and answers, particularly with supplementaries, or we won't manage to get through them all. And I call question number one, Willie Rennie. To ask the Scottish Government what impact reductions to the Fife Health and Social Care Partnership budget will have on its ability to meet rising demand for social care. Jean Freeman. Uh, the Fife Integration Joint Board budget has not decreased, but has increased by £14.7 million this year, taking their budget to a total of £511.7 million. The IJB uh, Board uh, has reduced its budgetary pressures by nearly £9 million since it was established in 2016-17. Uh, the deficit, uh, which continues to need to be addressed, it needs to be addressed by NHS Fife and Fife Council and the IJB, and together with COSLA, we are engaging with them to systematically reduce that deficit in a planned way without reducing capacity. Willie Rennie. <clears throat> But the, the demand for social care is rising and there's a £15 million gap in the budget of the partnership. As a result, the Lang Centre and the St David Centre in my constituency are to close, charges have increased and complex and respite care packages are to be cut. So what is the Cabinet Secretary going to do to make this stop? Jean Freeman. Well, first of all, I'm going to use accurate figures. There isn't a £15 million gap. There is, at the moment, in the 1920 budget, an £8.5 million gap, which, as I said in the answer to my first question, has come down uh, by some £15 million, from, uh, 15 million pounds, which is a deficit budget that the IJB was uh, started off with uh, and was a deficit budget agreed by NHS Fife and Fife Council. And actually what happens is that every year since then, both the Council and the Health Board have contributed to reducing that IJB's annual overspend, which seems to me to be an uh, imprudent way of uh, bringing down a deficit that the IJB did not itself create since it was there when it started. And that is exactly the approach that we are trying between COSLA and ourselves 
to get the three parties, the IJB, Fife, uh, and uh, Fife Council and the Health Board to agree that over a three-year period, for example, they take a systematic approach to reducing that deficit, which would not cost the Health Board or the Council any more money than they have already uh, uh, put out annually, but would allow uh, the IJB to operate on a sounder financial footing. And in terms of the increased demand, of course, that is why in my health budget uh, that was approved by this Parliament, uh, we uh, provided an additional £160 million, pounds, an additional £160 million pounds through local authorities for the purpose of integrating health and social care in order to recognise the additional demands being placed on them from that rising demographic challenge. Supplementary, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Cabinet Secretary what discussions have taken place between Fife Health and Social Care Partnership and the Scottish Government around the increase in social care service charges and what the likely impact of these increases will be. Jean Freeman. So the question of social service uh, care charges uh, is a question for local authorities to determine. That is for uh, them to uh, reach decisions uh, in terms of how they wish to allocate their uh, resources uh, and apply that across all the responsibilities they have. However, across the country, there is disparity in this question. Uh, and there are some uh, concerns raised directly with me, I'm sure, with members about it. All of that is factoring into the current review that we are undertaking uh, on adult social care, uh, which also includes uh, the uh, leadership of those on the receiving end of social care, so that uh, we can find a better position overall to ensure there is a consistent standard across the country for the delivery and the charging of social care. Question number two, Liz Smith. <coughs> To ask the Scottish Government which NHS boards offer robotic-assisted prostatectomy as a method of surgery for prostate cancer. Jean Freeman. Uh, all NH Scotland boards offer robotic-assisted prostatectomy, uh, and they do that on a regional basis across three high-volume centres uh, in Ab Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Glasgow. Les Smith. Uh, could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that? It has been brought to my attention, however, that patients in NHS Tayside can currently only access RAP as a method of surgery for prostate cancer through an out-of-area referral. So can I ask her what assessment have ministers made of outcomes for patients receiving surgery in Tayside and what discussions have ministers had with NHS Tayside regarding investment in that surgery? Jean Freeman. Um, I'm grateful to Ms Smith for her supplementary. If by out-of-air area referral she means those regional centres, then it is exactly as I said in my first answer. Um, the, the referral from NHS Tayside would be to uh, Aberdeen, Glasgow or Edinburgh. Of course, the decision uh, on uh, providing uh, this procedure in that way is a clinically led and driven uh, decision. Um, it is for the clinicians to follow up on uh, their individual um, uh, patients uh, from our uh, work on uh, looking at how uh, there are outcomes in terms of different procedures. There have been no issues raised with us uh, directly in, in regard to this particular procedure. And it is actually for NHS Tayside uh, itself as a board to determine in conjunction with its own clinicians as to whether or not they think that there should be uh, additional provision made for patients in NHS Tayside, and then properly they bring that to us. That's not happened, uh, but it may of course happen in the future. Question number three, Peter <coughs> Chapman. To ask the Scottish Government how much compensation has been paid to NHS Grampian staff in each year since 2016 for incidents or injuries in the workplace. Jade Freeman. Uh, I'm grateful to the member. The total uh, level of compensation claims uh, by staff uh, since 2016, the total amount uh, is £144,000. Uh, that over uh, 2016 to 2018 breaks down as 16,500 in the first year, 30,823 in 2017, and 96,771 pounds in 2018. Peter Chapman. I thank the cabinet secretary for that answer. This is a significant sum and has risen year on year. These payments were made for a variety of incidents, including exposure to contaminated blood and violence at, hands of the, at the hands of the public. 
This government has presided over a staffing crisis over the last 12 years. Fewer employees are being asked to do more. As a result, frontline staff work in demanding and stressful environments. Of course, the real issue here uh, is Can NHS you get to your question, please, Mr Chairman? Exactly that. The real issue here is NHS grabbing has been consistently underfunded by this government. Could you get to your question, please, Mr Chapman? I believe it's high time the region was given a fair share of resources. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree? Jane well, Freeman. Well, I'm not going to agree with factually inaccurate statements. First of all, there isn't a staffing crisis driven by lower than usual numbers of staff. In fact, our staffing numbers across the board have increased uh, in NHS Scotland. The member has heard me say this many times. I'm very happy to send him yet again the detail of that. Nor is NHS Grampian underfunded. We've been through this before. Nonetheless, the important point of this question, I'm disappointed Mr Chapman didn't get to it, is the safety of our staff and the work that we do uh, across all our health boards to ensure that staff are protected uh, as safe as possible and that where instances of violence or aggression or unsafe practice damages them, that we take those very seriously. We look to review our policies and see where improvement might be made, and we make compensation where that is the case. So I think there is another way of looking at this, and that is to see that the indicators are that we take this very seriously. And my final point is, all the policies and all the practice that we undertake in terms of keeping staff safe, including uh, the increased work that is underway in terms of mental health and well-being, is undertaken directly with the staff organisations and trade unions involved, and that is exactly the right way to do it. Supplementary, David Stewart. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. How much compensation was paid to NHS Grampian staff in each year since 2016, specifically for bullying? And could the Cabinet set to provide the figures, perhaps in writing, for each Scottish board? I'm particularly interested, obviously, in NHS Highland and Tayside, where staff have expressed long-standing, persistent concerns about bullying. Jane Freeman. Um, I, I don't have that, that specific figure uh, available, um, but as Mr Stewart has said, I'm very happy to provide him uh, with as much of that information as we hold centrally as soon as I can. Question number four, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Fife and what issues were discussed. Jane Freeman. Um, Scottish ministers and uh, government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Fife. Uh, I last met the chair of the health board on the 25th of March. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Is the cabinet secretary familiar with the Improving the Cancer Journey service, which was initially piloted in Fife and then rolled out along with Macmillan Cancer Support, which sees partners from Housing, Health, Voluntary and Financial Support Services working together to support people with cancer? With figures from the Scottish Cancer Patient Experience Survey published yesterday showing the need for more signposting for patients towards support and welfare advice and the need for health partners to have a stake in this and also revealing that less than a third of people question, received please? a care plan, what is the Sc Scottish Government doing to support the sharing of best practice like the ICG service in Fife more widely? Jean Freeman. I'm grateful to Ms Baker for raising what is a really important question. The survey, as she knows, uh, is, is one that was conducted uh, by Macmillan Cancer and the work that we undertake in this area is jointly with Macmillan uh, Cancer Services. Uh, that survey also indicated uh, a over 90% a satisfaction rate, I think 95 and 96 percent satisfaction rate on the part of patients in terms of the care that they received. However, significant improvements are required on the information that, that people receive, both at the time of diagnosis and the capacity to go back once you've absorbed that diagnosis and ask further questions and get further information. With Macmillan Cancer, we will now analyse the results of that uh, survey and look at the specific areas of improvement that we need to make and I'd hope to be able to update the Chamber on that shortly. Supplementary, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. The Fife Health and Social Care Partnership was due to meet last week to uh, approve a new multidisciplinary model for out of hours services in St Andrews. However, the meeting was cancelled, leaving communities stuck with the same contingency arrangements that they've had for the last year. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the reasons for this delay and for how long will patients in North East Fife have to travel nearly an hour to out-of-hours appointments in Kokori? Jean Freeman. Uh, so my understanding is that the Fife Health and Social Care Partnership is due to meet at the end of May. 
uh, where they will receive a number of proposals in terms of the delivery of services throughout Fife and including North East Fife. The member will recall, of course, that in uh, the latter part of last year, uh, I specifically asked the IJB not to proceed at that point with the proposals that they had at that stage uh, because there was a, a significant degree of local concern about those, including local concern around their engagement on that. And there were uh, specific requests to the Health Board uh, from uh, two local organisations. Uh, I understand that uh, I'm not aware, therefore, of any reason why a, a more recent meeting has been cancelled. Uh, I understand that improvements have been made, that there have been significant discussions in North East Fife, including with the university, uh, that look to uh, provide some answers to the concerns that local people had raised about the accessibility and the delivery of service. There is increased use of paramedics, uh, advanced nurse practitioners and so on. And the detail of that, presiding officer, uh, I'm happy to ensure uh, that the member has that, but it will be the end of May when the IJB, as I understand it, considers all the proposals. Now, I have another four <coughs> questions here, and I know that I'm not going to get through them all. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I know that you like to give lots of information, and that can be appreciated, but if you could perhaps truncate your answer somewhat. I know, it's difficult. Uh, but move to number five, John Scott. Now, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to minimise the risk to patient care arising from warnings of budget deficits in NHS Ayrshire and Arran and other NHS board areas. Jean Freeman. Well, I, I, I'm not sure what evidence that the member has to suggest that patient uh, care is uh, at any risk. In Ayrshire and Arran, they're going to receive another 720 million. Their uh, most recent results in terms of hospital, hospital standardised mortality ratio uh, published in February of this year are improved even on the Scottish results. So all the indicators that we have in terms of patient safety are showing that Ayrshire and Arran is doing better in some instances than the rest of Scotland. And of course, Scotland is doing very well on those kind of indicators. So I'm not really clear what concerns the member has specifically. John Scott. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. However, Lewis, McDonald, Lewis Morrison, Chair of the Doctors' Union BMA Scotland, has said that his members say on a regular basis and indeed reported in a major survey that 97% of doctors feel that inadequate resources are affecting the quality and safety of care and I have particular concerns about NHS Air Shannon. What will the Scottish Government do in order to help doctors deliver better patient care in Ayrshire and Scotland? Jean Freeman. Well, of course, I firmly believe, as indeed does uh, Lewis MacDonald from the BMA, that the, GP, the new GP contract is a significant step forward in helping doctors and particular GPs uh, do the work that they need to do. But if Mr MacDonald or indeed Mr Scott likes to bring me their specific concerns, I will, of course, look at them. Supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary advise the Chamber as to the percentage of Scotland's resource budget allocated to the NHS? And can she confirm whether all health ban consequentials are assigned to NHS Scotland? And if so, does she agree that any shortfall in NHS funding in Scotland is down to the austerity of Mr Scott's UK Tory government colleagues? Jean Freeman. Uh, health expenditure is the largest element of the Scottish Government's budget, accounting for 43% of total government expenditure, a rise from 37% in 2010-11. This year it will exceed £14 billion, and our recently published medium-term financial framework sets out a proposal for further funding of £2.7 billion between now and 23-24. And of course, Mr Gibson is perfectly correct. In real terms, our budget will be cut by 6.8%, uh, in terms of what it should be, and that is entirely down to the approach of the Westminster Government. Question number six, Anna Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to research from Glasgow Caledonia University that suggests a tenfold increase in HIV infection rates amongst drug users in Glasgow. Joe Fitzpatrick. Uh, thank you, Mr Sarwar, for bringing this important question to the Chamber. I know it will be appreciated by the people who lie behind those figures. 
Um, I welcome the research from Glasgow Caledonia and University and Health Protection Scotland on the causes of the outbreak of HIV identification in, identified in 2015 uh, amongst people who inject drugs in Glasgow. The research was done in collaboration with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and is an example of the kind of joint working that has been vital to tackling the outbreak. The most recent HIV figures published yesterday suggest that the outbreak is coming under control, but there is no room for complacency. Prevention of HIV transmission remains a clear priority for the Scottish Government. Anna Sarwar. I thank the Minister for that answer and also say I support the Government's calls for a safe injecting room in Glasgow to help tackle this issue. But alongside that, will the Scottish Government commit to two things? One, to have a new drug strategy that reflects the reality in too many of our communities across Scotland. And secondly, what urgent action they will take to tackle homelessness, which is also identified as one of the key reasons of the increase. Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank uh, Mr Sarwar for his further question and both the points that he, he makes are, are, are very important and they're both points which are recognised within the, the new drug strategy and we absolutely acknowledge that more must be done to tackle the harms and the deaths associated with drug use. Um, it, it is complex and, and that is why um, our strategy challenges um, um, our stakeholders to adapt and service providers to adapt to ensure that they provide a high quality person centred approach and to, to better engage with and meet the needs of those um, who are most at risk as a result of their drug use. The, 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 the member is, is right to, to um, to talk about the, the safe um, consumption facility, I think it is a really important, it's an evidence-based uh, proposal which will make a difference, which would save lives. And uh, again, I, I think I have to emphasise again, if the UK government are not prepared to take action which will save, save lives here in Scotland, then they should transfer the powers to this parliament where we can make those decisions to save those lives in Glasgow and elsewhere in Scotland. Supplementary, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In September of 2017, Glasgow, Greater and Clyde closed the needle exchange within the city centre. Now, this has widely been noted as part of the increase in infection rates we've seen. Does the Cabinet Secretary now think that was a mistake? Joe Fitzpatrick. The, um, mem <laughs> I, I won't take the promotion. Um, <laughs> um, I... Um, <laughs> The, the member makes a, an interesting point. Obviously, the, the, the service within uh, Glasgow Central Station the decision there was, was not one which um, Glasgow uh, Health and Social Care supported. Um, and it was, I think, a regrettable decision that those services were removed. Since then, we've been working with um, Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership as they look to address the wider issues. But specifically, I know that the, 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 the service in Glasgow um, are now um, providing and developing outreach work where they're, they're taking that service directly to um, th those people who require it um, and that's actually proving um, more adaptable because it's able to move to wherever it is required so I, I think it was regrettable that that, that that decision was taken it was not one that was within our our uh, control um, and we did try to, to reverse that I know that the previous public health minister um, had a, a lot of engagement to try and, and turn that around um, but I think it's, it's good to see that Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership working to find alternative provision in the area. That concludes portfolio question times and can I uh, apologise to Colin Smith and Mark Macdonald for not reaching their questions. Uh, can I also make an observation that um, in this particular portfolio ministerial responses did take a long time. However, in fairness, I have to say that some of the questions that were put were asked for an awful lot of information. And some of these questions may well be better considered as written questions in the future in order that we can make sure that everyone gets a fair shout at health portfolio questions. Thank you very much. And the next item of business we will move on to when everyone's settled. Well, not everyone, when the main players are settled.